The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 You'll hear a young student asking the social organizer of his school for information about organized trips. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. We shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Good morning. Good morning. How can I help you? I understand that the school organizes um, trips to different... Yes, we run five every month. Three during weekends and two Wednesday afternoon trips. What sort of places? Well, obviously it varies, but always places of historical interest and also which offer a variety of shopping because our students always ask about that. And then we go for ones where we know there are guided tours because this gives a good focus for the visit. Um, do you travel far? Well, we're lucky here, obviously, because we're able to say that all our visits are less than three hours' drive. How much do they cost? Oh, again, it varies. Between five and fifteen pounds a head, depending on distance. Uh-huh. Oh, and we do offer to arrange special trips if, you know, there are more than twelve people. Oh, right. I'll keep that in mind. And uh, what are the times normally? We try to keep it pretty fixed so that, that students get to know the pattern. We leave at 8.30 a.m. and return at 6 p.m. We figure it's best to keep the day fairly short. Oh, yes. And um, how do we reserve a place? You sign your name on the notice board. Do you know where it is? Uh-huh. I saw it this morning. And we do ask that you sign up three days in advance, so we know we've got enough people interested to run it, and we can cancel if necessary, with full refund, of course. That's fine. Thanks. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. And what visits are planned for this term? Right, well, I'm afraid the schedule hasn't been printed out yet, but uh, we have confirmed the dates and planned the optional extra visits, which you can also book in advance if you want to. Oh, that's all right. Um, if you can just give some idea of the weekend ones, so I can, you know, work out when to see friends, etc. Oh, sure. Well, uh, the first one is St. Ives. That's on the 13th of February, and we'll have only 16 places available, because uh, we're going by minibus. And that's a day in town with the optional extra of visiting the Hepworth Museum. All right. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, then there's a London trip on the 16th of February, and we'll be taking a medium-sized coach, so there'll be 45 places on that. And let's see, the optional extra is the Tower of London. Oh, I've already been there. Yeah. Uh, after that, there's Bristol on the 3rd of March. Where? Bristol. B-R-I-S-T-O-L. Okay. That's um, in a different minibus with 18 places available. Oh, and the optional extra is a visit to the SS Great Britain. OK. We're going to Salisbury on the 18th of March. And that's always a popular one because the optional extra is Stonehenge. Ah. So we're taking the large coach with 50 seats. Oh, good. And then the last one is to Bath on the 23rd of March. Oh, yes. Is Bath the Roman city? Yes, that's right. And that's in the 16-seater minibus. And where's the optional visit? It's to the American Museum 
Well worth a visit. Okay, well, that's great. Um, thanks for all that. My pleasure. Oh, by the way, if you want more information about any of the trips, have a look in the student newspaper. Okay. Or have a word with my assistant. Her name is Jane Yentob. That's Y E N T O B. Right, I've got that. Thank you very much for all your help. You're very welcome. I hope you enjoy the trips. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a tour guide talking to her tour group. First, you will have time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to sixteen. We're approaching Gateman's house now, which is at the entrance to Lord Thundleberry's estate. The tour shall begin shortly, so I want to draw your attention to a few things on the map and remind everyone of the itinerary. First of all, we're going to head to the Lord's residence to view the inside of this beautiful 18th-century building. After that, we've a short trip across the road to the classic car centre. This showcase is the Lord's personal collection of classic cars, one of the largest in the world. Then we'll head back down the road, leading away from the Lord's residence, and take a right. This will lead us up to the organic farm. Here, you'll learn how to grow your own organic vegetables and taste some of the fresh food that is made by the estate's excellent on-site chefs. From the organic farm, we'll head to the other side of the main road. You are likely to catch sight of many deer grazing on this part of the estate. On the right-hand side of the road, there's the wine museum, that's close to the vineyard you see on the map there. After that, we'll head back to Gatesman's house for afternoon tea. Once we've had some refreshments, we'll jump back onto the bus and drive a little way up the road to the estate library, which is on the right-hand side. The library has a huge collection of books, so you are sure to find something of interest there. Next, we're on to the old mill, which is just a little way up the minor road across from the library. Finally, we'll continue on up the minor road until we come to the great waterfall. This is a spectacular feature of the estate and one of the largest man-made waterfalls in the British Isles. It won't fail to impress, I can assure you. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions seventeen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions seventeen to twenty. Now, I just have a few guidelines to outline before we embark on our tour. First of all, please bear in mind that this is the private residence of the Lord, and it is a privilege to be shown around the estate. The estate is only open for pre-arranged visits. I would ask all of you to be on the best possible conduct and keep noise levels down in consideration of the people who live and work here. This is, after all, a fully functional estate and the main residency of Lord Thundleberry himself. Please refrain from wandering away from the main tour party. Areas of the estate which have restricted access should not be trespassed under any circumstances. If anyone fails to observe these rules. Our two group could be evicted immediately. Finally, it will be some time before we return to the Gatesman's house for afternoon tea. So I suggest we set aside a half hour or so to enjoy the packed lunch that the tour organizer provided in the Rose Gardens outside the Lords' residence at around midday. Okay. If no one has any questions, shall we proceed? That is the end of part two. 
You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a museum director talking to several student interns, explaining their internship duties at the museum. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. As you listen to the first part of the conversation, answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Welcome to the City Museum of Art. I'm Dr. Shirley Johnson, the director of the museum's internship program. Today, I'll be giving you an orientation to the museum and our museum administrator's internship program. Will we get a chance to tour the museum today? Yes. We'll start right now with a tour of the building. We'll skip the basement. Most of that part of the building is devoted to art conservation, which won't be part of your internship. Let's begin here on the ground floor with the museum offices. I guess this is where we'll be spending most of our time, helping with the office work. You'll spend some time working in here, so you can learn what the administrative duties involve. But you'll also get a chance to experience all aspects of museum work. This room in here is the museum tours office. I'm interested in that. I'd really like to help out with the tours. That's great because you'll all have a chance to lead some tours and maybe even to develop a tour of your own too. Let's go up to the second floor now. This is the boardroom in here, isn't it? Will we get to go to board meetings? Only members of the board of directors attend those. Now, back here behind the galleries are the classrooms. You're all welcome to attend any class you want at no charge. But we won't be teaching any, will we? No, the staff of the education department is responsible for that. Let's move up to the third floor now and the research department. Each of you will spend some time working in here. Great, I'd like to help with the research. We're working on some very interesting research projects right now. Also, as an extension of your research work, you'll probably contribute to some of the museum's brochures. I'm looking forward to that. I like writing about art. Another thing I've been hoping to be able to do is meet some artists. You're in luck then. We've planned a reception for the first day of your internship. And you'll have the chance to meet several local artists then. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Could you give us a little background of the museum? I mean, when it was built, and some information about the collections and things like that. Of course, the main part of the museum was built in eighteen ninety-five, with a combination of public and private funds. The new wing was built sixty years later. With a donation from the Rheinbeck family, that part of the museum was built for the modern art collection, wasn't it? Yes, it was. In the main part of the museum, we have a gallery devoted to works by local artists, our sculpture collection, and a small collection of classical European art. You mentioned classes earlier. What kinds of classes does the museum offer? In our adult education program, we offer a series of art history classes, and for children, we have a program of arts and crafts workshops. You can get a brochure from the office that will give you more information. I saw a lot of chairs set up in the main hall. 
What are those for? Those are there for tonight's musical performance. We offer a weekly concert series during the fall and winter, and of course, all of you are welcome to attend. Now, if there are no more questions, let's step into my office and I'll show you your schedules. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a lecture about Iron Age in Britain. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully to the message and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I am going to introduce to you a special age in Britain, the Iron Age. People at that time, you may be surprised to hear that, seem close to the men and women of today because archaeologists discovered that they tried to vary their diet, improve their homes, and follow fashions. The period known as the Iron Age lasted in Britain for about eight hundred years. From 750 BC to 43 AD, there had been several dramatic changes by the end of the Iron Age, including coinage, wheel-thrown pottery, etc. People had started to live in larger and more settled communities. Furthermore, because of the differences in climate and geography, someone living in Yorkshire or Ireland would have eaten different food, worn different clothing. And lived in different housing conditions from someone living in southern Britain. Caesar commented that Britain was a land of small farms, and this has been proven by the archaeological evidence. Since Iron Age society was primarily agricultural, it is safe to presume that the daily routine would have revolved around the maintenance of the crops and livestock. Small farmsteads were tended by and would have supported isolated communities of family or extended family size. They produced enough to live on and a little extra to exchange for commodities that the farmers were unable to provide for themselves. For those farms, harvested crops were stored in either granaries that were raised from the ground on posts or in bell-shaped pits two to three meters deep. Some four thousand five hundred of these storage pits have been found within the hill fort interior at Danebury in Hampshire, and if they were all used to store crops, this would have essentially made the site one large fortified granary. Although the archaeological evidence shows that cattle and sheep would have been the most common farm animals, it is known that pigs were also kept. The animals would have aided the family. Not only with heavy farm labor in the case of the cattle, such as the plowing of crop fields, but also as a valuable form of wool or hide and food products. Horses and dogs are also observed in the archaeological evidence from both faunal remains and artifacts. Horses were used for pulling two or four wheeled vehicles, carts, chariots, while dogs would have assisted in the herding of the livestock and hunting. Besides agriculture and stock raising. The architecture in Iron Age is also worth mentioning. A very well-preserved settlement has been discovered at the site of Chiselster in Cornwall. It was made up of individual houses of stone with garden plots. In Wessex, the typical building on a settlement would have been the large round house. All of the domestic life would have occurred within this. The main frame of the round house would have been made of upright timbers, which were interwoven with coppiced wood. Usually hazel, oak, ash, or pollarded willow to make wattle walls. This was then covered with a daub made of clay, soil, straw, and animal manure that would weatherproof the house. The roof was constructed from large timbers and densely thatched. The main focus of the interior of the house was the central open hearth fire. This was the heart of the house to provide cooked food, warmth, and light. Because its importance within the domestic sphere, the fire would have been maintained twenty-four hours a day. 
Beside the fire may have stood a pair of fire dogs, such as those found at Baldock in Herefordshire, or suspended above it a bronze cauldron held up by a tripod and attached with an adjustable chain. The ordinary basic cooking pots would have been made by hand, from the local clay, and came in varying rounded shapes, occasionally with simple incised decorations. As for eating, bread would have been an important part of any meal. And was made from wheat and barley. The dough would have then been baked in a simple clay-domed oven, of which evidence has been found in Iron Age houses. The barley and rye could also have been made into a kind of porridge. In addition to this, the grain was also fermented to make beer, and the surface foam that formed was scraped off and used in the bread-making process. The interior of the house was an ideal place for the drying and preservation of food. Smoke and heat from the constant fire would have smoked meat and fish, and would have dried herbs and other plants perfectly. Salt was another means of preserving meat for the cold winter months, but this was a commodity that could not be made at a typical settlement. Well, you can see that Iron Age people lived a decent life, didn't they? I'm going to introduce their culture and leisure time next time. Thank you. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.